the, the consequence of these factors is that intelligence starts, to, which is highly genetic, remember, starts to decline. And because in, and intelligence has been shown by research by Richard Lynn and Tatu Vandenen to be associated with every dimension of civilization you could possibly think of. And so what happens is that civilization starts to decline. And then you find that you, a democracy would start to decline as well because there's a degree to which intelligence is associated with that. Uh, minimum IQ of about 90 because intelli intelligence also correlates with trust, trusting people. Um, and so things start to go backwards and you start to find that you can't do things that you used to be able to do. And I would suggest, for example, that we probably can't get Concord back in the air. And the reason that we can't is because India, let's say, it can do lots of brilliant things. It has an IQ of only about 78, but it does have massive genetic diversity, and consequently there are some very clever people that are from India. But the problem is that it's low average IQ. And this means that there's lots of space for lots of little things to go wrong all the time car that breaks down, the da -da -da -da, it's less reliable. And that's what Concorde was about. That, that What went wrong with Concorde, i.e. a bit of badly made jagged metal falling off the back of the Airbus onto the, onto the thing and Concorde flying over it, burning its tyre, that could have happened at any point in Concorde's history. Um, but it just happened to be since 69. But it just happened to be the case that on that occasion there were a number of people who were stupid enough to make these stupid mistakes as we live in this over-promoted society in which every generation since 1800 the people at the top have boiled off and not passed on their genes and their, their, these positions that they would have held have been taken by the second grade, the second grade, second rate minds, then the third rate minds, then the fourth rate minds of 1800. And so this is what's going on. And so we're going to get. To, I suspect we will go backwards. Um, we, I think we could argue we already are doing on various things. I mean, innovation is a good example. So we, if you look at per capita innovation, so uh, major inventions per million of population per year, we go up from uh, about 10, 1100 onwards. We reach a peak in about 1870, and then we start going down. And in terms of per capita innovation, we are now at the level that we were in 1600. Hello champs, recently I sat down with Dr. Edward Dutton, a polythemist and expert in areas of anthropology, theology, human intelligence, Darwinian selection, evolution, genetics and more. Dutton retains an honorary position at the University of Ulu in Finland where he used to lecture and today he publishes heaps of books, tours the world giving speeches and runs a YouTube channel called The Jolly Heretic. He's an intellectual and an educator and he's hilarious. We talked about intelligence, society, ethnocentrism, democracy, the impact of spiteful mutants on our civilization and the future of the West no longer under normal Darwinian conditions. Dutton is an incredibly interesting bloke. He's basically a walking encyclopedia and he never stops. He's like how he is on his YouTube channel all the time, bounds of energy. Like, for example, we went into this little pub after our interview and Dutton is chatting away as the bar girl is pouring us some Cornish ales and he's talking to both me and her, including her in the conversation to be polite and fun. And he's wearing his cravat and he's telling this story. I I'd offered him a bag of nuts and he said, no, no, I never eat nuts. I don't eat nuts. And so I'm like, oh, you have, a, you have a nut allergy? And he said, no, but I knew a girl who died eating nuts, so I don't eat nuts again. It's sort of, it's sort of his, his protest. A nut shall never pass into the interior of my mouth again. <laughs> he said this quite seriously. Uh, and then he just changes tack. He's still, girl's pouring herself. She's right there. And he changes tack and he goes, do you know, do you know, I had a friend at university called Alex. And Alex was autistic. And of course, autism correlates highly with depression and identity issues. So Alex became a woman, you see. And he worked as a prostitute and then he was murdered. <laughs> just, <laughs> just telling the story like that in the pub. He's, he's hilarious and he's interesting. The way he breaks down society and analyzes what's going on in this world is fascinating. So I really hope you all enjoy this interview where we pick up on the conversation. Ed is talking about a study he conducted with Richard Lynn on the relationship between intelligence and religiousness. Enjoy. But it's interesting in terms of the, the there's some evidence that inter intelligence has been selected for concomitantly with religiousness. So, so as we've moved from being hunter-gatherers, hunter-gatherers are, in our sense of the word, the collective worship of a moral god or whatever, they're not particularly religious, there's none of that. They, they, they see the world as, as a series of spirits that underpin everything. There's not much select religiousness. Why is it selected for? Well, partly it's selected, it seems, to reduce mortality salience, stress mortality salience, okay, they've got to deal with that. But partly it seems to be a moral issue 
So religiousness correlates uh, at the individual level with conscientiousness, i.e. impulse control, and agreeableness, um, uh, i.e. altruism and empathy. Um, and <clears throat> As we become, as we move away from hunter gatherers towards farming and then towards living in cities, there's a selection pressure to be more conscientious, to be more agreeable, because you've got large numbers of people in small number of spaces, smaller amount of space. You've got to get on with people. You've got to also plan for the future more in farming. So these personality traits predict that you've got to get on with people more, and so these kinds of traits go up. And so, if religiousness would elevate those traits, if, if believing you were being watched would elevate those traits, then it would be selected for. And of course it does. We've got experimental evidence on this. If you believe you're being watched, you become more pro-social. Um, sorry if I'm yaffing on here. Um, mm. you, you, you become more pro-social uh, and you become more rule-following and whatever. And so what we would think is that religiousness was being selected for precisely because it was making people more pro-social. Therefore, they weren't being cast out by the ban. Therefore, they were being better at farming or whatever as well because of the correlates of conscientiousness um, and consequently um, uh, you know but also intelligence is being selected for and we know that even research that's been done on hunter gatherers is in is proxy indicators like um, how good they are organizing things or, or, or uh, uh, how good they are t talking down other people or whatever um, indicates that the people that are the headmen of let's say bushman tribes are the most intelligent and those people have the most children i mean 60 percent of bushman men don't have any children at all 40 percent uh, have children have all the children and they have multiple wives um and so intelligence is being selected for as we move become more developed into farming then there's more, even more of a premium on intelligence as we move into cities there's even more of a premium on intelligence as you become more specialized which requires more intelligence which pushes out these less intelligent people mm -hmm. but at the same time there's more of a premium on religiousness because you move into cities you've got to be able to you've got to you've got to cooperate in, in in terms of, let's say, group selection, the group that we know from computer models is the most likely to survive under Darwinian conditions in battles against other groups is the group that's the highest in positive and negative ethnocentrism, i.e. internal cooperation um, and externally being prepared to make sacrifices for the group. This is, this and, is exactly what I mean. And so, Sorry, and so, Paul, and so, what, and so yeah. what this means, <laughs> what this means is that you've got this premium on intelligence. We know that. We know that up until the Industrial Revolution, there was a selection for intelligence each generation. We've got data on this from Wills. We know the richer 50% of the society had about double the number of surviving children the poor 50% did. So we were getting more intelligent every generation, which is consistent with a rise in per capita of genius across this period, rise in per capita use of um, a very complex words from texture analysis and other things like this. Um, <clears throat> but we were also getting more uh, religious, which makes sense, because once you get a city state or whatever, then you, you, you how do you make people cooperate with each other so that you can have a society that's group selected? I mean, they're not going to get any payback on their behavior to a stranger. Uh, how, why should they trust a stranger? Well, if they believe in the same God that's watching them and is moral and, and, and whatever, then that becomes an insurance policy. So religiousness f helps to ensure that these city organisations cooperate, and so it helps to make them more group selected. And so it becomes selected for at the group level, at the individual level, and so intelligence and religiousness are being selected for at the same time. And we know that religiousness is about 40% genetic. It's definitely a, a, something that's been under selection because it's 40% genetic. Um, religious experience is 66% genetic. Um, it, it is, it is uh, associated with fertility, even now. It's associated with mental and physical health, even now. It's associated with pro-social personality. Specific parts of the brain seem to light up when, when religious experiences happen, and you get it across culture, across the world. So these things have been selected for at the same time. And so what that would make one think, when things are selected for at the same time, they tend to become pleiotropically related. So in the same way, women sexually select for intelligence in men, because they want to have a high status man, because then that man can look after them and look after the baby, and then the baby is more likely to survive. So they select for intelligence in men. That's by, by virtue of selecting for uh, status. But they also select for height, because they want a man that can look after them in fights and whatever. <clears throat> and, and so those things have become related. And there is even now a weak relationship between intelligence and height, genetic relationship between those two things. And so what you'd predict is that intelligence would become genetically related to, um, uh, to, uh, to religiousness under these conditions. Mm -hmm. So that it may be that this negative relationship is only happening now, it's, but, it, but it wasn't the case historically. So you wrote a book on ethnocentrism. Isn't it evil? This is what people say. Ethnocentrism is evil. It's evil that uh, in European uh, 
universities we study European history. That's ethnocentric. <coughs> uh, that's uh, that's Eurocentric. If white people are interested in white things, or if we we like our own stuff, mm. and it's not diverse. If we're attracted to our own, perhaps there's some sort of underlying racism there. Uh, the, the whole sort of contemporary zeitgeist seems to tell us that uh, to love the other is good, and to to love our own and maybe to be shut off from the other is. Uh, you disagree with this? Maybe you haven't perceived it. I've no, perceived it as like guys. Yes, I'm just thinking that they tell us to love the other, but they do not tell the other to love us. So it's, <laughs> so it's, perfectly, it's, it's perfectly acceptable for the Greenlandic to be ethnocentric, or for the Sami to be ethnocentric, or yeah. for any, any other. Well, liberals are celebrated when that Christian preacher or evangelical is, uh, he went to the <laughs> island with the tribe and they killed him. The left just thought it was hilarious. This tribe. Oh yes, I recall. Yes, in, in, the uh, in, the, in the Andaman Islands. Yes. yes, that's right. Well, I mean, yes, because they were highly ethnocentric, and they that is why they've survived. That is why uh, that Stone Age or, um, group of tribes on the Andaman Islands have been have been left alone because they're so uh, highly, possibly negatively ethnocentric, or at least negatively ethnocentric, that they they have been left alone. Yeah. Whereas groups that were less like that, such as the Inuit or the Native Americans, who were less negatively ethnocentric, well, they've been completely decimated by contact with other, other with, with Europeans. Yes. So, well, so why do you think then, just given those quick examples, uh, why do you think that this is uh, sold as something that is is part of the barbarity of former man, and it's something that we are t- too sophisticated for today, and we should really have surpassed it, and those who haven't, they're nativist, they're racist, they're evil... Why do you think some people feel that? Well, I look at this in my in in the book. I mean, it's my colleague's idea, really. It's called the social epistasis amplification model. So the idea is that in, until um, industrial revolution, which we were under conditions of harsh Darwinian selection, and we were selecting for intelligence, yes, of course, but we were also selecting for health. And uh, the child mortality rate up until about eighteen hundred was forty percent. And even once you got to adulthood, it didn't mean you'd breed, it was a smaller percent again of those that would pass on their genes. And so it was very strong um, purifying Darwinian selection, which ensured the survival of the richest and the the survival of the fittest. Now, we know that um, um, these mutations, basically, there would have been mutations, children born with mutations every generation, and these children wouldn't have reached adulthood normally, they would have died of childhood diseases. Now, mutations of the body tend to be, which is well, a poor immune system or whatever, which is what would have killed them, tend to be comorbid with mutations of the mind, because the mind is about 88% of the genome. 88% of our genes are, relate to the brain. It's so complex. So um, they're comorbid. So it's a good marker. I did a book called How to Judge People by What They Look Like, which uh, a while ago, where I looked at this way that you can, you can judge a person's character and intelligence from what they look like, which you can. So people that are less intelligent, for example, tend to have certain markers. They tend to have small smaller eyes, for example, smaller noses. Um, if you think about what someone that has very low intelligence looks like, such as some Down syndrome, then a, a person who has low intelligence within the normal range kind of looks subtly more like that. <laughs> but, 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 yes. you know, i.e. smaller nose, smaller eyes, that kind of thing. You know, these minor physical abnormalities which are indicating that the brain has developed suboptimally, either for due to genetic, due to mutational load or a poor environment or a combination of the two. And so this is what was going on, 40% child mortality. So this was by purging the society every generation of these people who had poor immune systems and whatever, physical maladaptations, it was also purging people who had mental maladaptations. And uh, mental maladaptations that if they you know, would, that would have caused them to have problems under conditions of Darwinian selection, that would have meant they wouldn't have been adapted, that they wouldn't have passed on their genes, that w- w- whatever. Now, with the Industrial Revolution, of course, what happens is that Dar- the, the Darwinian selection that is weakened very substantially. Um, in particular, the level of child mortality has gone from 40% in 1800 to now about 1%. So you've got all these people living today, about 90% of the, British po- of the native British population, who would, they'd never have lived, in a, they, they, and their grandparents would never have lived, and their great-grandparents would never have lived, because their great-grandmother would have died of, 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 of measles or whatever. Um, and those people can be expected to have not just poor immune systems, poor physical health, uh, markers of mutational load and whatever, and maybe even to be physically unattractive. I mean, we know that we've got uh, my colleagues done a study on this, Michael Woodley of Mani, um, that he, we're getting more ugly. We've got analyses of skulls. We're, we're getting more phys- uh, more asymmetry in the face 
over time, over analyses of representative samples of skulls, we're becoming physically more ugly, which is consistent with this. So these mutations of the body are building up, and concomitantly mutations of the mind are building up, things that would be maladaptive under Darwinian conditions, such which you know, it's what my colleague calls spiteful mutations. So such as the inclination to not want to pass on your genes at all, or the inclination to to um to, to not help your genetic interests by being nationalistic or whatever, but to help the genetic interests of other groups that would destroy any group under Darwinian conditions, um, such as uh, deviant sexuality, which would mean that you wouldn't pass on your genes, such as uh, 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 believing yourself to be a woman when you're really a man, uh, yeah, or, or whatever it happens to be. These things you would predict, these spiteful ideas, would, that would be maladaptive, <coughs> would become more prominent because the people that carried them would no, are no longer be dying out as children. Now, it gets worse because, of course, Darwinian selection didn't stop, didn't weaken everywhere at the same time. It we, Industrial Revolution meant we have, we have inoculations, we have better health care, we have better medicine, we have better living conditions, better public health. But this starts off with the upper class and then kind of spreads down the society. So it wasn't 40% child mortality in 1800 for everybody. It was 40% on average. It could have been 80% for the working class or whatever. Um, so that means that you're going to get more of these spiteful mutants am among the higher classes. Because we know that across time, there's research by Gregory uh, Clark of uh, Princeton, uh, sorry, of um, uh, University of California, Davis, um, that looks, he's, there's a very interesting book called... Um, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, the, 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 the Sun Also Rises, and he looks at um, the heritability of socioeconomic status from about 1200 to about 1950, it's, it, across generations, it's about 70%. So there's, it, it's highly heritable. So we're talking about uh, social classes being strong, you know, quite static, really. Um, and consistent with this, we know that there's the average blood types that are different between social classes in, in England. Um, and so what this is going to mean is that these spiteful mutants are going to start, are going to emanate from the higher social classes because they've been, un those classes have been under Darwinian selection for less time. So you're going to get these spiteful mutants and they will get into positions of power. And once they do that, then of course, it, this is where the mutations become really spiteful because they can then, they can then start to undermine the institutions which society has developed to elevate its own genetic interests. And this is very interesting in terms of ethnocentrism, because if you think about what religion does, what is the key purpose of religion? Yes, the evolution of religion, pro-sociality and all this kind of thing, but ultimately it, it seems to be getting um, things that promote positive and negative ethnocentrism and societies that survive in the battle of group selection between other groups versus resources, and it makes those the will of God. So it's that God says you should have lots of children. God says you should lay down your life for your society. God says, and, and by making it the will of God, it makes it more likely to be to be followed. So that's what the, that's what that's what religion is doing. Religion is a, a highly adaptive thing. So of course, what do these spiteful mutants do? They undermine religion. They advocate atheism. They advocate whatever. They they they, they mock it. And and this means that people who even even by they undermining the institution. Even those who don't carry the spiteful mutation, even those who are genetically relatively normal, can be maladaptively influenced by these spiteful mutants. So you can imagine a spiteful mutant who's a feminist, for example, and she encourages, and indeed there's quite good evidence that if you look at the kind of women that, that, where feminism started in the UK, they were often spinsters, that's what it often started among spinsters. There was a spinster crisis in Victorian England, middle class men would marry late, they'd go off to the empire, there was a massive shortage of, women, of men in this country in about, uh, on the 1880 census, I think it was that there was a million more, un, a million, there was an excess of a million unmarried women over the age of 45. And, um, and these women would get involved in the church and things and be, be religious, which could be regarded as a group-selected good thing. But if, gradually those kinds of people got involved in things like the women's rights movement and, and, and uh, uh, the vote thing and, and feminism. And, the, and the, so they tell, they, they, make it, they bring about the cultural meme that if you're a woman and you're just a housewife and a mother and whatever, you're just a loser and you're pathetic. And so consequently, you get generations of women who delay their fertility and find that they delay it too late and they can't have children, or they can only have a very small number of children, because, because they don't start trying for kids until they're 30, or, or, or whatever it happens to be. So that's an example of spiteful mutation, feminism. Another one, atheism. Atheism, as I say, undermines ethnocentrism and the desire to go to war and always lay down your life and the, the view that you're, you're um, 
life has eternal significance and so on, make people depressed and down and a sense of nihilism and whatever. Postmodernism, similarly. Multiculturalism, the idea that you, you ultimately, the, it's been demonstrated by Frank Salter's research that in his book On Genetic Interests that we can pass on our genes in different ways. You can pass on directly by having kids, you can pass them on at the kin level by looking after your nieces and nephews and whatever, and, and you can pass them on at the level of the extended genotype, i.e. the ethnic group. And he shows that these are distinct genetic clusters. And so that if you, uh, if you, um, uh, me and you as two English people would be a baseline of nil relatedness, but if we were in a situation of conflict with two French people, then it would inherently be in my interest to look up to look after you because just because you're English, it would be in my and so J. Philip Rushton has shown this in his research on genetic similarity theory that even friends tend to be more genetically sim similar than could be the case by chance. They're helping to pass on each other's genes, and so these spiteful mutants are undermining all this. They are they are they are maladaptive. They are sick. They are they are they are mutants <laughs> who who would have been washed out under normal Darwinian conditions, but they're not because those conditions have collapsed, uh, and consequently they they reach positions of power in the society. They become and they influence the society to destroy itself, and yeah. that includes in undermining therefore its ethnocentrism. Um, and then what do they do? They bring in this multicultural idea, uh, which have a multicultural society, and they bring into the society. People uh, from Asia and Africa who have been under Darwinian selection for longer than we have, and consequently who still have these ethnic, these ethnocentric instincts and religiousness and and uh, these adaptive instincts um, to a greater extent than we are. Hmm. Than we have. It would be akin to letting wild animals into a zoo, as I say in the book, and and, and this is what is happening. You made a video on conservatives and liberals. And how they, how they, very often it's difficult for them to be friends because the liberal will just think the conservative is evil and a Nazi and da la la la. Mm. And uh, the conservative might be able to understand the liberal's positions but may disagree with them, but the liberal won't uh, have any understanding on the other end. I was just wondering, you know, given that we, we live in, in a democracy where we pitch these two groups against one another, therefore there's a, there's a, a battle between. The, the liberals and the or, or the lefties and the conservatives or the right wingers that seems to me to like, exacerbate tensions between these two groups. But does that further undermine positive ethnocentrism if you have a, a society that then is divided down the middle and told to battle it out for political power? Does that make well? Does um, this, does this further weaken the society? Is that what democracy is actually doing? Uh, I think that's a very interesting point. Um, you, you, you could argue on the one hand that we, we should see... So, uh, Hugh, uh, E.O. Wilson argued that we shouldn't see us in, in comparison to chimpanzees. We're not like chimpanzees. We should compare ourselves more to bees or ants or whatever. We're eusocial. We're this highly social species. Mm. Um, and this is where, therefore, you have the group selection. So you can, um, what is in a, uh, if there's two hives of bees that are competing for limited resources, then the beehive that's going to triumph is going to be the one that has the optimum numbers of, um, you know, of queens and drones and workers and feeders and, and these other castes. And if it has, uh, if, the, if a member of the feeder caste is it some sort of mutant and she gives too much food to this larvae and too little to this and whatever and you get askew too many queens not enough workers then that um, beehive will likely lose in the battle of selection against um, an, an, another beehive so there has to be this optimum level of each sort of caste within the society they won't necessarily all now if we transpose this over to human societies um, you're going to get the people that are very conformist and whatever and, and follow the rules you're going to get the, maybe the genius types who are going to have very which two tends to combine outlier high intelligence with moderately antisocial personality but it's good to have an optimum number of these because these are the people that innovate brilliant things such as new weapons or whatever um, because new ideas almost always offend uh, vested interests. But they don't care about that. And so you need to have an optimum number of those people, an optimum number of, of different niches, really. And the more complex society is, the more of these niches you're going to need. And so in that sense, the more different people will be. Um, and in fact, there's evidence that in third world countries, the level of personality difference, like the difference between, let's say, the nastiest person and the nicest person, is the person that's highest in agreeableness and the one that's lowest in it, is narrower than is the case in more developed countries. Because precisely because we're more developed, we develop more of these niches which require um, uh, more specialisation, which require more diverse 
personality sets and, and, and whatever. So in that sense, it could be argued that diversity is a function of being highly developed and it's a, it's a, it's a good thing, um, um, as long as there's an optimum level of trust this is fundamental, and Putnam um, looked at this very interesting research. He found that one of the things that multiculturalism does is it destroys trust. So I think we, we've always had liberals and conservatives in Britain. We've always had these things. But um, we go back to 100 years or 200 years we had this. But we, but we had higher levels of trust. Uh, why did we have higher levels of trust? Firstly, because we were more religious, and religiousness promotes Ethnocentrism, positive, negative, of course, and it promotes trust because you know the person believes in God like you do. He believes he's going to be burning in hell if he does this wrong like you do or whatever. And so it promotes, you know, the, the, you know he's, there's certain boundaries of, 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 over which he won't cross, it's assumed. It promotes trust. He's a believer. You can trust him. Um, secondly, you know, he's, he's like me. He's genetically similar to me. We can trust him. Okay? And once you get a multicultural society like we have now, it undermines trust. First of all, it undermines community trust because people are genetically different from the foreigners and they don't trust them. But it also undermines trust even within the natives. Because the natives now perceive there to be foreigners with whom some of their own group can collaborate against them. And they, and they blame each other for kind of somehow allowing this invasion um, to occur. And so trust collapses even among the natives. Um, and this is what I think has happened. So it's not that the liberals and conservatives, I mean, yeah, yes, there is a degree to which they, they can't get on. That's true. There is a degree to which, to which um, perhaps we will always move in a leftwards direction because with these five moral foundations, and I, I, I forget all of them, I can't list them for you now, I'm afraid, but the, 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 if you can put them on the screen later, but the, the five moral foundations that Hyde promotes, um, Conservatives are kind of roughly equal in all of them, whereas liberals tend to like sort of three of them, and they're very low in group loyalty, in disgust, and in certain moral foundations. Um, so the sense of fair play, well, we both kind of have that, and so we can empathise with them, we conservatives can empathise with them, because we have all five of the foundations, more than they can empathise with us, mm. because they only have these three. In, in, in a way, they're, they're less complex, they're more sort of simple, in the way they see the world. Um, so that is true. Um, um, but but, but it, it's rendered the, what we're seeing now in the UK or whatever with this, and this in America with this, just this nastiness is I don't think it's simply a product of that. I think it's more than that. It's, it's, it's because the, the, the it's thing that... It's not just a product of democracy. No, the really. thing that holds democracy together, you can't have democracy in a multicultural society. It's impossible. Because in order mm. to have democracy, you have to have trust. And B, which, is, which goes in a multicultural society, there's a degree to which you have to have some kind of belief in sort of higher values that are, that are somehow beyond question, you know, free speech or truth or whatever. Right, there must be a consensus. There must be. And these things go as well. The, the, the idea that it's ultimately, I, I would argue, that a belief in truth could be understood to be backed up by some form of kind of neo-Platonic religiosity. If you believe that truth is fundamentally important, that's why you asked me earlier about believing in God. And I, I, when I was at university, I'd say people called me atheist Ed, and I was just this rabid, you know, anti-religion, whatever, and religion is the enemy of science. But the more I thought about it recently, the more I thought, well, I'm not quite sure, but maybe I'd like my scientists to believe in God, or at least believe in something. Because, because, if, because they have to have a fundamental belief in the truth. If they don't have that, then why not just manipulate their research for social reasons to get power or to get prestige or whatever? They have to have a fundamental belief in the truth, that the truth is sacred. And that's what was always believed historically um, in, 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 in science. Neo-Thomism, this, this belief that what you were doing as a scientist was you were revealing more about God's creation. And so to lie was blasphemy. I mean, to lie was an appalling thing to do. I mean, people like this, Isaac Newton was deeply religious. And it was that that motivated what he was doing. He wanted to understand the nature of God's, God's creation. Uh, and so and this was kind of instilled in them, this, this idea of the truth and the importance of the truth, even after they perhaps stopped overtly believing in God. You can perhaps call it an implicit religion uh, of, of, that was there. This belief, and that's now gone. You've got this postmodernism and this idea that you were well, the truth, well, you know, is there such a thing as truth? Or truth is just about power, it's reducible to power, it's reducible to conflict. Um, the, the, you've got scientists like Daniel Dennett, a philosopher of science, openly saying that it's acceptable to lie about certain scientific facts if they would cause social problems, openly said that. 
so so you know the whole thing um, collapses. So yeah, a democracy you can't you have to have trust. You have to have basically a reasonable degree of genetic similarity uh, of being one ethnic group of having one of religion and therefore this idea that certain things you've got to tell the truth, certain things are sacred um, for democracy to work. Uh, and, and once you stop that, then the democracy will collapse for, for, due to the low trust, due to the lack of a belief in, in, in a higher sort of destiny or whatever, um, due to the lack of a belief in truth, and due to the fact that you'll start getting foreigners voting along racial lines, which will then really mess it up. So, um, yeah, I think you, you, what we're seeing in Britain is the collapse of democracy. Mm. And, and, and this is inevitable. It was inevitable the moment that, that uh, Windrush ship came along in 1948 or whenever it was, it was inevitable that the democracy would, would fall, it, it will fall. Societies work in cycles. Uh, what tends to happen is that they select for intelligence, they reach a certain high level of intelligence and inventiveness, and they, and they then become very luxurious. So standards of living are very high. Mm. When standards of living are very high, um, certain things start to happen. People start to question, uh, oh, well, first of all, the gene pool becomes larger and you'll get some kind of rise in spiteful mutants, as I've referred to them earlier. In our case, it's a massive rise because, because of what we've managed to achieve. Um, secondly, you get people doubting religiousness. Religiousness at the environmental level is associated with uh, stress and particularly mortality stress. And so once this is very low, you get people doubting religiousness. Which then also do, which then undermines the martial values and positive and negative ethnocentrism of the society, and which then also be doubting as well because of spiteful mutants that will inspire them to doubt it because of the luxuriousness and the, the, the lower child mortality rate among um, the upper class. Uh, often you get the development of contraception, um, and contraception tends to be taken up by the upper classes, uh, and therefore uh, having who, who are intelligent enough and are low in stress enough and low in religiousness enough to be able to rationalise everything including the having of children. And so they tend to stop having children. Even in Rome, this was noticed. This was noticed um, by, by the time of Augustus, that the upper class was just ceasing to have children. Uh, they didn't even invent particularly good contraception, the Romans, but the upper class was ceasing to have children. Uh, and, and then they were charged a tax if they failed to have children, and they paid the tax. But they didn't want to have children. They wanted to have their life adventures. You know, they wanted to get their Lonely Planet guide and go on the road less travelled by. And, and be, be anthropologists in swimming trunks. That's what they wanted to do. And that's exactly what the higher classes in, in the West are doing now. That's precisely what they're doing. And so the, the girl who, who's of low IQ, low intelligence, she tends to uh, get married, you know, drop out of school at 16, have a series of children by unsuitable men, and she's a grandmother at 40 or 38 or something, when her more intelligent uh, contemporary, who has uh, spent all of her 20s and the first half of her 30s dedicated to her university and her career, is thinking about having kids, and then finding that she can't have any, or she can only have one or two, or what to balance it with her work life or whatever. And so the consequence is that intelligence starts to... Uh, and then you get... Uh, the, the consequence of these factors is that intelligence starts to... Which is highly genetic, remember, starts to decline. I mean, innovation is a good example. So we, if you look at per capita innovation, so uh, major inventions per million of population per year, we go up from uh, about 10, 1100 onwards, we reach a peak in about 1870, and then we start going down. And in terms of per capita innovation, we are now at the level that we were in 1600, uh, when Elizabeth I was on the throne. We are one third of peak, peak being 1870. If you look at uh, uh, per use of very, very hard words by analysing literature across time, we are uh, at something like 1650. Um, we're, now, it's a bit different, of course, because, of course, they had a lower standard of living than us, but, but that's what's going on. So we're, we're, we're going backwards, we're going backwards very quickly. A current uh, rate, in a hundred years from now, in terms of capital innovation, will be back to about 1100 again. So what, what, what I suspect is that we will just go backwards and we won't be able to do things we used to be able to do. That's what's going to happen. I mean, you know, at the moment, if you divide Britain into families... Who, have, who where both parents are working, families where one parent is on welfare, and families where both parents are on welfare. The only group with above replacement fertility are the families where both parents are on welfare. And they, they would have an IQ of about 80. So over a standard deviation below the mean, unemployable. Those, that's the future. So at that and religious people, those are the two groups that breed, and obviously Muslims.
So you, you that's so what we could do is slow it down, slow down the decline, do things to make it. It will happen. It's inevitable. It will happen unless you were to bring in some kind of dysgenics whereby forty percent of children were killed every generation. It, it, it will happen, and you, could, you won't be able to do that. So it is almost certainly going to happen. But the question is, can it slow it down so that we it doesn't become an appalling collapse, and we can get higher next time. How can we slow it down? Well, it's clear what's causing it. Um, welfare is causing it. Get rid of that. Uh, or limit it to, to what it used to be, which was an absolute safety net for people that are deserving poor and who have just had a ter- you know, terribly bad luck or whatever. Limit it heavily to something that can't possibly be a lifestyle. Um, there has to be a situation to heavily encourage intelligent women to have more children, um, such as by... Uh, allowing them to, to you know, have children in their 20s and then go to university later somehow, or something like that, if they want to go to university, uh, and, and helping them if they want to be housewives. We need to go back to a situation where it's possible to live off one income so that we don't have this difficult, this problematic situation. So that needs to be done. Immigration is inherently from lower IQ countries. What's that doing? A, it's reducing the IQ in general, because people have lower IQ. I mean, the average IQ in Denmark, if we, set, if we put that at 100, then the average IQ of the non-Danes in Denmark is 80. So, uh, in this country, the average IQ of Muslims is 89. Uh, it's 11 points below Europe, uh, English people. So, so, this obviously has to be limited. It also undermines intelligence at the environmental level, because then it's more complex to deal with the schools and whatever, and so it's more complex to teach things, and so children learning less, and so da, da, da. so this is a problem. So immigration needs to be stopped and indeed reversed, and 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 these factors will help to slow it down. We also need to talk, think, think about knowledge storage and long-term knowledge storage and things like thing, things like this, um, and uh, and the, then it can be at least slowed down. Basically, it's the reimposition of traditional values, traditional ways of doing things. Uh, people have religiously inspired, and people confident, they tend to have more children. Um, so, so that's another thing. You can elevate the fertility of European people in religiousness, traditionalism. These things will slow it down. Now, I say that to you, and you agree with me, because we're probably part of the 10% of the population that would have survived under Darwinian conditions. We're, <laughs> we're, 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 we're group selected. We're, that's what they were, these people that survived. They were group selected people. If you think about the way uh, in World War I that people could be persuaded to go throw themselves at machine guns, on the, you know, you would, they, could, they were group selected. That's what they were. You don't get people like that now. You think you could get that now? People would be talking about their human rights and, their, and, their, and whatever. You couldn't persuade people to go and mobilise in that kind of way. It would be possible. Part of mobilising was religion. God's on our side and all that. You wouldn't get anything like that. You've got this confidence sapped out of people. Um, it, the, the, the stories run out. It needs to be put back in again. So it's the traditionalism, really. Um, that is what would slow down the decline so that late next time we can we can get even... Uh, even further, and also simply, it just makes people happier, and we've got. It just makes it a better life. We know what things religiousness seems to make people happier. People that are involved in a community of religion where they worship, they have higher uh, physical uh, wellness, uh, mental wellness, and they are literally happier. Uh, people that have children seem to be happier, and uh, people that are married seem to be happier. Um, uh, uh, and so it just, it just, people, women don't want to do full time work. They vote with their feet uh, by going part time later or whatever. They seem to be happier doing, which makes sense. They're doing the role they're selected to do. That's what they're selected genetically to do um, in evolutionary terms. So if, if you have a mismatch, it makes people unhappy. In much the same way that when Bushmen in Namibia at the moment are being taken out of the, the sort of forests, basically, under the rather um, spurious excuse of preserving the wildlife and put on these appalling reservations where it's nothing to do with drink, well, of course they're not, they're not used to it, and so they just drink themselves to death very quickly. Not, it's a mismatch, it's an evolutionary mismatch. People don't like evolutionary mismatch. It's the equivalent of getting a dog and locking it in a house all day. We're in a zoo, and we don't want to be in a zoo. We're in a zoo, it's too much of a zoo. We can make it less of a zoo. At least a kind of one of those safari parks where you can wander around while cars drive through. We could aim for that. <laughs> okay, I think that was, that was fantastic. Uh, thanks very much. That's a pleasure, thank you very much.